Good morning, everyone, and welcome to um, Friday Morning Journal Club. I'm extremely excited about this morning's program um, and would like to go ahead and introduce our speakers very, very briefly. And then from there, um, just want to encourage everyone to um, pose your questions, and we're going to do our best to uh, get to those questions before the nine o'clock hour. Um, well, it's my extreme pleasure to introduce uh, Anna Saka, who is our uh, presenter this morning. She's an associate professor at the University of Toronto in the Department of Endocrinology. As a clinician scientist with a PhD in clinical epidemiology and biostatistics, her research has focused on um, a variety of issues related to thyroid cancer that include cancer treatments and outcomes, thyroid cancer survivorship, medical decision-making, and distress and quality of life and thyroid disorders. Um, she, uh, throughout her career, has been funded by a number of different awards. Um, and so it's really a pleasure to have Dr. Saka presenting this morning. Uh, this morning's um, discussant uh, comes to us from um, Australia, David Pattison is a dual degree nuclear medicine physician and endocrinologist. <clears throat> he is deputy director of the Department of Nuclear Medicine and specialized in pet services at Royal Brisbane and Women's Hospital. He um, has an academic appointment at the University of Queensland as well. He is a, a clinical and research, he has clinical and research interest in molecular imaging rad and radionucleotide. Um, therapy and endocrine malignancies, both thyroid cancer and neuroendocrine tumors. So I want to thank both of you um, up front, and I'm going to hand the program over. Um, for all of you, again, I just encourage you to pose your questions, um, and we will do our best to get to them um, before the end of the hour. Um, uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Erkin, and thank you also to the Thank Foundation for um, inviting me to do this presentation. Um, we're going to be discussing a paper that our group had published a couple years ago, and um, we'll start with uh, just my disclosure. So um, I've had a number of academic peer-reviewed operating uh, grants, large, largely uh, government-funded and society-funded. Um, there's really uh, no industry disclosures. And the paper that I'll be talking about, we did have some library fees and page charges, which were uh, rather nominal, paid by uh, um, a foundation account from donors. And this work, uh, which really is unfunded, was only made possible through the hard work and enthusiasm of medical trainees at various uh, levels who uh, co-authored the paper. So this is the, pres uh, the uh, case that uh, Dr. Erkin has uh, presented us with. And uh, essentially, uh, this is a 47-year-old female with a medical history significant for papillary thyroid carcinoma, who was treated with a total thyroidectomy and after that received 150 millicuries of I-131. Uh, she presents four years later with a palpable mass in the right level uh, four cervical region, undergoes a um, uh, ultrasound, which shows a round and cystic appearing lymph node, fine needle aspiration biopsy was performed and positive for metastatic papillary thyroid cancer with elevated thyroglobin levels on needle rinse. She then underwent a selective neck dissection, which revealed nine out of 22 lymph nodes that were positive for malignancy, and she was scheduled to receive an additional 100 millicuries of I-131 uh, treatment after this uh, surgery. The patient tells you she's concerned about receiving a second course of radioactive iodine because she's read an increased cumulative dose of I-131 is associated with an increased risk of secondary malignancies. And at this point, you explain, and there's four options here to select. A, additional I-131 doses are not associated with higher risk of second malignancies. B, risk of second malignancies are only observed after a cumulative dose of 500 millicuries of I-131. C, it is unknown if additional radioiodine treatment results in higher risk of second malignancies. 
And D, alternative treatment should be considered due to the high risk that additional radioiodine could result in a second malignancy. And I think I just should clarify a little bit of terminology. I think what is meant here by second malignancy is a second non-thyroid malignancy. So a second primary malignancy, um, I think, is really uh, the, the question that's uh, referred to here. So I understand the poll is open. I'll take a cue from um, uh, uh, Dr. Urkin or Ariana when you would like me to continue. Yes, we are um, pretty much spread across all of the uh, options here with a um, almost two thirds of the audience um, suggesting that the association uh, is not clearly known. Uh, so with that, let's have you uh, go right ahead here. Okay, great. So the paper, uh, paper for uh, discussion is, uh, as I mentioned, a paper we had published in Thyroid a couple of years ago. And um, this was a systematic review and meta-analysis, which was actually an update of a prior systematic review of meta-analysis published about 10 years later, uh, 10 years earlier, I should say. And um, I'll, I'll go into the paper, but first I thought it would be helpful for us to think about um, a theoretical framework of factors for consideration in oncogenicity of cancer treatments. And so this is kind of a general uh, framework. Um, some of this is from things I've read and some of these uh, I've kind of thought of on my own, but I think it, it's helpful for us to take the time to think about these concepts as we consider the, the, the topic that we're discussing, both from a standpoint of interpreting and appraising the literature um, on populations subject to uh, radioiodine treatment, as well as uh, considerations in individual patient care. So the first thing is um, you need a potentially oncogenic treatment. So what does that really mean? And this is a treatment that may disrupt DNA and cause mutagenesis. In terms of radioiodine, I don't go into it in this presentation because of interest of time, but there are there is some evidence that um, uh, uh, that DNA uh, can be disrupted. Um, secondly, you need susceptible organs that are exposed to the treatment. And, and I would like to also say by exposure, um, the, the dosage absorbed to organs may vary. So it would be in a sufficient dosage absorbed by the organ uh, for the oncogenic effect to occur. An example I've given here would be bone marrow, which would be a consideration in radioiodine uh, treatment to high dose activities. Thirdly is time. So you need time to de develop a second primary malignancy. The latency period, which is the latency period, the time from developing the first malignancy being treated and then developing the second primary malignancy. So this is really only a uh, relevant issue for malignancies that have a high long-term survival rate, as we would see typically in uh, papillary thyroid cancer. And of course, latency periods may vary according to the type of second malignancies. So we know from the um, general oncology and hemat hematology oncology literature, hematologic malignancies may have shorter latency periods, so occur earlier after an oncogenic uh, agent is administered than solid tumors, which may actually take up to decades to appear. So that's important to consider. We also um, need to consider exposure to other potential oncogenic treatments. So potentially if the patient had external beam radiation treatment um, uh, in close, close time proximity to the radioiodine treatment, uh, forms of chemotherapeutic agents or others. A fifth factor is host factors. So this presentation is based on papers in adults. And um, we know that age at time of exposure, for example, childhood exposure to radiation may have differing uh, effects on risk uh, oncogenic risk of uh, treatments. Another factor would be personal risk of malignancy due to uh, genetic, environmental, or lifestyle factors, and possible interactions between all these factors, as well as the potential oncogenic agent. 
And we also know that there is individual variability in DNA, DNA repair efficiency. So even if that DNA is dis disrupted, we know um, uh, not everyone may necessarily be able to uh, repair uh, that DNA uh, in the same, uh, uh, to the same degree. A sixth factor that I think we need to consider is uh, in ascertainment bias or potential even overdiagnosis of second cancers in, in patients due to diagnostic imaging testing that we perform. For example, routine imaging uh, screening for disease surveillance of primary cancer um, in the case of uh, patients who've had childhood exposure to radi head and neck radiation. Uh, some of these patients are subject to um, screening ultrasounds of the neck. Um, so patients who may be uh, subject to more sensitive procedures uh, may be more likely to be diagnosed with a second cancer. Secondly, even our disease surveillance, if you think about it for uh, our neck ultrasounds that we do in patients who've been treated for thyroid cancer, um, also may pick up salivary malignancies, which, may, uh, which are in the imaging field and may be detected incidentally. So again, we are doing some testing um, and uh, it's the behave, our behavior um, as healthcare providers, as well as behavior of the patient in terms of attitudes to screening that may also impact um, uh, the diagnosis of second primary malignancy. So in terms of terminology, um, there's traditionally, I previously used the term second primary malignancies um, and more recently, a term that's been favored in the literature is subsequent malignant neoplasms, which is basically the same thing. These are cancers that are diagnosed at some point after the primary malignancy. Now, I briefly mentioned latency period, and that's the time between the exposure, in this case, the radioiodine treatment for thyroid cancer, and the diagnosis of this second cancer. Um, and when thinking about latency period, we know that some certain tumors or, or certain second malignancies may have varying latency periods to develop after exposure to that oncogenic agent. Um, a tumor that is diagnosed the day after, for example, the radioiodine treatment is likely not related to the radioiodine treatment. And so I think that uh, another factor is that in some, some literature, um, there may be some arbitrary periods, such as the first year or, or uh, thereabouts, where uh, second primary malignancies might be excluded. But again, it depends on the type of malignancy because latency periods can vary. So there are some assumptions there, whether you assume that um, early uh, second primary malignancies diagnosed early after the primary malignancy are really indeed second primary malignancies or should not be uh, included. Um, uh, particularly if you're considering the oncogenic uh, risk of the treatment. Uh, lastly, um, radioiodine. I just would like to uh, explain that this presentation is strictly about radioiodine treatment given for thyroid cancer. So this is post-surgical radioactive iodine uh, not in doses exceeding that would, that we would use for typical imaging. This would include remnant ablation, adjuvant treatment, or treatment of persistent disease. This would not include um, diagnostic scanning and does not include radioiodine given prior to the malignancy, for example, for hyperthyroidism due to Graves' disease or for other reasons. So that, this is the context of radioiodine treatment in this presentation. Although I'm not going to go into it, I think you should also be aware of uh, some of the terminology, um, some of which I will go into, but some of the terminology and distinguishing that in the second primary malignancy uh, literature. So first of all, there's the standardized incidence uh, ratio. Sorry, I just... And this is the um, uh, disease rate in the group under study, which in our case would be thyroid cancer survivors divided by the disease rate in a reference population, such as the general population. So you may be looking at what is the risk of breast cancer and thyroid cancer survivors compared to the general population. Generally, these type of figures are adjusted for age, but they are the, what you're doing is you're comparing one population to another, and they do not necessarily account for the attributable risk from the treatment. So even if there is an increased standardized incidence ratio 
of a uh, malignancy in a population compared to the general population, that you cannot really infer that this is causality from the treatment uh, simply for that reason. It may imply that you need to study that further, whether the other oncogenic agent is causing a problem, but it does not necessarily prove that since these other issues, like I mentioned, in terms of ascertainment and screening and other factors may actually predispose, and genetic factors may predispose certain populations to more than one kind of cancer. So that's important to keep in mind. I will be discussing the relative risk, also referred to as the risk ratio or RR. And the risk is, this is the ratio of probabilities of an event occurring in one group. So in this case, thyroid cancer patients treated with radioiodine divided by the probability of the event occurring in another group. And that's thyroid cancer patients not treated with radioiodine. So you're using the same type of population and you're um, examining the risk according to whether the treatment was given or not. So that's very different than a standardized incidence ratio. It's also important to keep in mind that with relative risks, um, although the, in calculating you, you include the absolute risk, you, you need to actually be aware of the absolute risk. For example, if we said that the, um, uh, if we had absolute risks of 1% um, divided by 3%, the risk would be 33% or vice versa if you did 3% versus 1%. So the reality is that you will also need to keep in mind the absolute probability or absolute risk, as particularly for rare events, where relative risk can actually look quite striking, but when you actually look at the absolute numbers, the absolute increased risk for the patient um, uh, may actually be relatively small and not necessarily clinically meaningful. Okay. So what we'll discuss is um, uh, this systematic review, and this is an update of a prior systematic review that we, uh, we had published. So there was a lot of uh, some different individuals um, uh, uh, between the two papers, um, and uh, this was an update of a prior systematic review in 2009. Now, in 2009, it became uh, uh, clear, or in the years uh, leading up to that, that um, it was the issue of second primary malignancy risk after radioiodine treatment was an important topic both to patients and clinicians. Yet there was really a paucity of literature uh, to examine and in fact in our original systematic review in 2009 we included only two studies and one was from the uh, SEER uh, uh, database from US uh, from, published in 2008 um, and there have been multiple publications from SEER examining risk of second primary malignancies, both SIRs and some uh, relative risks over the years. And then a European cohort, cohort uh, that included uh, three different populations um, uh, from different centers. And it was clear that, you know, one of the main goals of this paper was a plea for uh, more research in this area uh, for meaningful uh, analysis um, when dealing with a paucity of events, such as second primary uh, malignancies, you actually need fairly large data sets for meaningful analysis. And uh, there really wasn't a lot of literature on this topic. We certainly did uh, review what was available and tried to analyze that, uh, but it was clear that there needed to be more literature. And what was actually quite heartening over the subsequent uh, years was uh, the there was a significant incremental increase in the published literature on this topic, including studies from other countries, other large databases being opened up, particularly from Asia. And it became very clear that the good news was that this was there was enough data there that we needed to uh, re-review this topic and update our systematic review and meta-analysis. Also, at the same time, there's been advances in methodology, both in systematic review and meta-analysis techniques, techniques of critical appraisal, um, approaches to models, and, uh, and, and new ways of doing models. So we wanted to incorporate that as well. So in terms of our objectives with the uh, uh, update, it was to update the 2009 systematic review and meta-analysis to compare and quantify 
the second um, malignant neoplasm risk among thyroid cancer patients treated with radioactive iodine after thyroid cancer surgery compared to those who did not have radioiodine. And the primary meta-analysis, which was uh, basically uh, derived from the prior uh, review, was a relative risk or risk ratio of any uh, second primary malignancy in uh, patients treated with radioiodine compared to those not treated with radioiodine. This was crude data using cumulative incidence rates over the entire duration of follow-up or lifetime of the patient, uh, whichever would have uh, occurred first. Um, but we also did some secondary analyses. We had more studies to work with, so you could actually do some secondary uh, analyses. Adjusted relative risks of any second malignancy um, uh, in the radioiodine treated versus no radioiodine treated. And this is including uh, data that included um, adjusted relative risks, um, or, uh, and I'll get into the methods a little more, our propensity analysis. So some adjustment for more than one uh, confounder in the analysis and pulling that data relative risk of respective individual second primary malignancies um, uh, uh, for a handful of malignancies for which there was sufficient data, and then some exploratory meta-analyses if, if we expected there'd likely be some heterogeneity in pulling the data, and so we stratified according to cumulative I-131 activity, which was a challenge in itself given paucity of data, um, but also study quality. So we'll go into that. So this is the uh, methodology. We included uh, published systematic reviews. So as of a handful of systematic reviews we reviewed, um, uh, ours included the most uh, sort of new studies. Um, so uh, we also cross-referenced those reviews for their uh, original studies. Um, and I won't be discussing those. I'll just be discussing um, our review of the trials or observational studies. And these were all observational studies. Um, and they were required to report the rate of second malignant neoplasm plasms and thyroid cancers survivors according to radioiodine treatment history or enough data that we could calculate it um, uh, for the risk for uh, from a risk estimate. Um, we really didn't have sufficient resources for extensive translation. Uh, so the although the search was done in other languages, uh, it, there was no language restriction on the search. We only included English English language reports, although from what I could tell, I don't think we missed a lot of studies. And another important point, when you're dealing with something like the SEER database, is there may be a dozen papers from the same database being published over that decade. And so you don't want to be double dipping the data and pooling the same patients more than once. The same patient can only be used for this for any particular outcome in one as as a uh, in in one analysis. So our approach to this was to um, use the either largest data set of the uh, eligible patients um, reporting on the outcomes that we were interested in according to radioiodine or most recent report, and generally that would be the same one. But again, it was where we would see the most relevant data uh, and most up to, most up to date um, that would be relevant to our analysis. So that was particularly relevant with the SEER database as well as uh, European cohort. And in terms of our study search, we had we were fortunate to have a library information specialist search six databases. This was updated up to March of 2018, um, and we cross-referenced um, um, articles. I had a lot of personal files related to prior guideline work as well, uh, and also I had been collecting some files on this topic because of personal interest. Um, we removed the duplicate citations, uh, both electronically and then manually checking. Uh, we had independent uh, review by two reviewers for each of the citations to decide which were potentially relevant. And if any either reviewer thought a citation was relevant, we obtained it in full text form and reviewed it for inclusion and consensus was achieved for inclusion among the two uh, independent reviewers for the full text papers. Now, critical appraisal, um, also done independently by two reviewers. We used a Cochrane risk of bias assessment tool available at the time. Um, for systematic reviews, we used AMSTAR, which I won't go into here. And again, we, um, if there were discrepancies in how we appraise the studies, we would have a meeting and discuss these and uh, achieve a final consensus. Data was also independently abstracted by two reviewers. And again, final consensus on the data included. 
And um, uh, so basically almost every step of the way through this process, uh, other than the electronic search, was actually done in duplicate by two independent individuals to try to reduce bias. Now, statistical analyses, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but I will probably I need to get into it a little bit. So we performed random effects meta-analyses, and this was uh, favored more than um, uh, at the time we wrote our uh, original paper. It can account for some of the variability between studies, and we did expect variability given that we were dealing with a variety of cancers, a variety of uh, popula global populations, and we chose to do random effects meta-analyses. And um, the, the outcomes we looked at was the relative risk of accumulative um, uh, second primary malignancy incidence over the entire duration of follow-up um, or, uh, or death um, uh, in the studies. Pooling of the uh, adjusted data, so these were studies where there was some form of multivariable explanatory model or propensity analysis. This kind of analysis was really not available when we did our first review. And it is subject to some, um, it's relatively novel and subject to some, um, it's finicky. So we used an inverse variance method where we would be able to pool the risk estimates. And even if they were alternative risk estimates, such as relative risk odds ratio, hazard ratio, if the event rates were um, uh, met, were relatively rare uh, as met by preset criteria under 10%, we were able to pool them all as if they were relative risk. Now the model's finicky with inverse variance. So a lot of the um, model would bump out studies that had uneven uh, un uh, non-symmetric confidence intervals and a variety of factors but it did give us a secondary analysis uh, in some ways that was adjusted for some confounders. Uh, and again, we were not were not able to control which confounders were adjusted for by any primary authors, but it did give a, it, it gave a second layer of uh, information. Uh, we also did secondary subgroup mixed effects analyses, trying to look at factors that impact heterogeneity. So when we saw there was heterogeneity in our meta-analysis, so variability among studies that we couldn't really explain, we tried to uh, stratify studies and see whether they would be explained by things like uh, radioiodine activity or study quality. Heterogeneity, which is um, a measure of variability of the risk estimates, was evaluated using Cochrane's Q and I square measure. These are standard. And potential publication bias, which is really only relevant if you have at least 10 studies, uh, was evaluated uh, for the primary analysis where we did have at least 10 studies. And this is the Prisma flow diagram. I'll just point out that we um, over 4,600 uh, citations were initially uh, um, uh, uh, identified. 3,500 when the duplicates were removed. And ultimately, you can see with all this drilling down uh, for the primary outcome, there were only 10 studies uh, included, and there's some secondary meta-analyses that I'll go into. Um, I'm not going to go into this, all the details of this busy slide. This is for all outcomes. Uh, so some of these were included in the second uh, primary malignancy out, uh, uh, outcome on prudent data. Some were included for, for example, breast cancer, leukemia. There were three SEER studies, but they were used in separate analyses for separate outcomes. Um, but what is very interesting here is that we see we started off with Europe and US, and now you can see that across Asia, Middle East, South America, uh, we're starting to see global literature on uh, second primary malignancy risk, which is actually quite uh, helpful. And actually, the largest study was not from US, but in fact, from uh, South Korea. You can see median follow-up two years. So this data database will be very rich in years to come as the uh, follow-up increases. Mean, follow, uh, mean or median follow-ups were variable, as you can see, from a couple of years up to about a decade or so. Uh, ideally, you want decades of follow-up, but uh, this is still not bad and probably better than the original um, you know, report where we really only had two studies. Um, almost all the studies had you know, significant limitations. You know, there was one study, I believe, that had low risk of bias, but everything else was pretty much moderate. There was one with serious. So it's also subject to limitations. So in terms of the meta-analysis of relative risk of any second primary malignancy, data from 10 studies were pooled, 
over 5,000 second primary malignancy events and over 65,000 thyroid cancer survivors. Uh, this is the, uh, so between two and a half and 12% of survivors developed a second malignancy in the duration of follow-up, which was five to 16 years. Uh, there's some real limitations here with the cumulative I-131 since this was only reported in uh, about half the studies anyways. Um, and, uh, uh, but uh, these are the, the activities that were reported. Um, most studies didn't report anything on how they were pre prepared for common TSH or whether people had a concurrent external beam. Um, and the relative risk, as you can see, is 0.98 with confidence intervals that cross one. Uh, there was a high degree of heterogeneity, meaning that there's a high degree of variability among studies. And there was some public bias uh, subject. So this is the forest plot. This is, you can see where, you, where are we missing studies with the publication bias studies that um, were less likely to be published that showed a protective effect of radioiodine on second primary malignancy risk. So that's a primary analysis. We also um, uh, looked at, as I mentioned, the studies that were statistically adjusted. And again, um, so we see it kind of flips to the other side, 1.16 for the relative risk and confidence intervals cross one, a lot of heterogeneity, and there's the forest plot for that. Uh, the most common second primary malignancy in, in um, at least six of the studies that reported a number of different ones was actually breast cancer, which is not surprising given the, uh, how common breast cancer is and, um, and uh, that many, uh, there is predisposition to thyroid cancer in uh, females and also some genetic predispositions known. So um, in seven studies uh, reporting on risk of breast cancer during the follow-up seven to 13 years, um, again, confidence intervals cross one, but a relative risk of 0.8. This was not significant and there was a high degree of heterogeneity. Other secondary meta-analyses, respective uh, uh, ones, this one is always uh, of interest. It's not really all that different from the uh, 10 years ago. There, uh, for leukemia, this was four studies, uh, over 367,000 patients. Again, rare event, 384 cumulative leukemia events. You can see 0.03 to 0.26%, two to 13 years, relative risk 1.6. And uh, that was uh, significant and no heterogeneity. Of course, there's a small number of studies which could also contribute to that, but no heterogeneity. Although it's rare, the, remember I mentioned, you got to think about absolute increased risk and that is actually only 0.05% if you look at the numbers. Multiple myeloma, this is also of some interest, not completely explained, only three studies, but 156,000 people. Again, relatively rare event, median follow-up nine to 13 years. And actually there was a reduced risk, sorry, that's a 0 0.42 um, of uh, melanoma in patients treated with radioiodine. Again, no heterogeneity, but small studies could contribute to underestimation of that. Salivary cancer, three studies, 54,000 individuals, no significant effect, no heterogeneity, but again, small number of studies. So those are secondary uh, analyses. For the primary analyses, there is some unexplained heterogeneity. Uh, we did try to look at whether cumulative activity could explain this, and it really couldn't, but you know, there was so, so many limitations, I think, in reporting of cumulative I-131 activity in the, some of the databases. The clinical databases, which are smaller, tend to have more information, but then you got less patients. And so we really didn't see an effect of that, but you know, you, I would not read too much into it because I think we need um, better data. Um, lower quality studies seem to have a slightly lower relative risk uh, or some protective effect of second malignant neoplasms. It's kind of interesting, but um, uh, again, most studies did have limitations. So limitations, methodological, methodological limitations of including of included studies, everything was subject to risk of bias. Um, uh, most of them were moderate risk of bias. Um, we excluded non-English studies, so we could have missed some uh, literature that was not in English. Follow-up periods and some of the included studies were relatively short, and this could be important when you're dealing with latency periods for solid tumors, which are longer than hematologic malignancies, so you could be underestimating those. Um, lack of more detail relating to I-131 dose activity. So I think that it, particularly big registries like SEER, it's not really well reported and people have complained about that in the literature. Uh, limited information on other treatments, TSH suppression, um, as some of them didn't even report on external beam radiation, although uh, presumably most patients didn't have it. Um, and this data is an adult, so it cannot generalize really to pediatric populations, different hosts, right? 
and the results may also may not be generalizable to genetically predisposed individuals or people who underwent radiation for other conditions. So does this apply to individuals, for example, who had pediatric head and neck radiation for Hodgkin's lymphoma, developed a second thyroid cancer? Well, there's another um, hit that's occurred even before the thyroid cancer. And um, uh, sorry, so that would be an environmental hit, but also in genetically predisposed. So conclusions. The body of evidence on whether radioiodine treatment of thyroid cancer is associated with the primary outcome is highly heterogeneous and complex. And no significant difference was demonstrated overall for the primary outcome of any second malignancy. But I think what we've learned now that we've actually had enough data that we've been actually being able to look at heterogeneity more, more meaningfully is that um, although we could not fully explain the heterogeneity by factors such as uh, radioiodine dose activity, which has its own limitations, um, really it's, it appears different for different malignancies. And that's actually, um, I think, an important point that all cancers are not created equal in terms of second malignancy risk due to an oncogenic factor, such as potentially radioiodine. The limited follow-up may certainly result in underestimation of risk, and that would be more relevant to solid tumors with long latency periods, and in a, a secondary analysis, there is some evidence of increased risk of leukemia, but you have to keep this in mind, reality check, excess absolute risk of only 0.05%. Uh, this was also observed uh, in the meta-analysis 10 years ago and in multiple publications. But again, this is a very rare diagnosis. In light of the heterogeneity among malignancies, I think that long-term outcome research is needed for respective second malignant neoplasm. So not necessarily pooling everything together, uh, uh, all cancers, but as we've got more data that's uh, being accumulated, particularly these large databases that are now accruing patients, um, we need more prospective studies, larger sample size, and looking at respective malignancies uh, separately. And that's it. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thanks very much for that uh, excellent presentation, Anna. Uh, and thanks to Mark uh, and the Thank Foundation for the opportunity to, uh, to speak to you today. Uh, so my name's David Patterson. I'll be speaking uh, from a, a nuclear medicine perspective about this. Um, and I'll just try to advance that slide. These are my disclosures. Uh, so essentially what I'll be trying to do is uh, well, first of all, I'll go through, there's another study that was listed as a recommended reading for this session. Um, so I'll, I'll go over that briefly. Uh, and then I'll also try to put a little bit of perspective as to, you know, how as a nuclear medicine uh, specialist, um, we use this uh, this information and, and, and the risk uh, or potential risk associated with radioactive iodine in our, in our clinical practice. Um, so we know about differentiated thyroid cancer. We're all familiar with this uh, you know, this slide, this is from Australian data, but it's been, you know, replicated around the world, essentially showing that over the last uh, several decades, there's been a significant increase in the incidence of, of thyroid cancer, um, but that the mortality has remained uh, constant. And in line with this over the last, particularly during the 1980s and 90s, there was a significant, uh, really quite a, a marked increase in the use of radioactive iodine uh, worldwide, particularly for, for low risk thyroid cancer. In terms of uh, thyroid cancer subtypes and prognosis, we're all familiar with this, the vast majority of papillary thyroid cancer, a smaller proportion of follicular. And we also know that the vast majority of patients uh, are cured with their initial treatment. It's a smaller proportion of about 15% of patients who develop recurrent or metastatic disease. Uh, and of this, uh, of this cohort, this is the group where we need to look at, you know, escalating therapies and doing what we can to, uh, to treat their recurrent or metastatic disease. But we also, there is a, this trend and we need to be mindful of potentially de-escalating our therapy uh, for the vast majority of patients who, who are cured with their initial treatment. Um, just looking at this, uh, this paper, this was one of the other um, recommended readings. Uh, so I thought I'd just, uh, knowing that Anna would cover her um, meta-analysis so well, I thought I'd just spend a, a few slides going over this, uh, which was quite a topical um, paper published uh, in, in 20, initially in, in 2017 online. Um, so this was uh, looking at the risk of hematologic malignancies specifically um, after radioiodine treatment of well-differentiated thyroid cancer, uh, published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology. Um, the premise was that radioactive iodine improves the overall and disease-free survival of advanced stage thyroid cancer, but there is still little definitive evidence, particularly with a lack of uh, randomized controlled trials looking at um, 
and clinical outcomes um, for the clinical benefit of radioactive iodine and low and intermediate risk tumours. Um, several meta-analyses had shown a small uh, increased relative risk of, of solid tumours and leukaemia uh, and it was presented there's a need to further characterise the risk of radioactive iodine in this population. So the methods of this study, it was assessing the, uh, the risks and outcomes of individual second haematologic malignancies uh, and looking at second haematologic malignancies in total. And so these were the, um, the seven malignancies listed there. I was using the SEER registry um, and with patients with low or intermediate risk uh, thyroid cancer uh, treated with surgery or surgery plus radioactive iodine. It's just worthwhile noting that uh, there are some features in this categorization that would have, um, they would not have necessarily excluded some patients with advanced risk. Uh, there was no, um, for example, patients with high thyroglobulin or, uh, or, or uh, incomplete resection, etc. Um, there was univariable and also multivariable fine grade competing risk regression analysis performed to calculate the risks of these secondary hematologic, hematologic malignancies and their outcomes. Now, it's quite the actual statistics that was used is uh, is quite complicated, and it, and it's certainly beyond the scope of uh, presenting this briefly uh, in this session. But ultimately, they identified thyroid cancers were identified, then these were the um, uh, these patients were excluded. Ultimately, left with 148,000 patients with thyroid cancer, of which they then uh, looked at the patient years at risk. Uh, for the secondary haematologic malignancy and, and the cohort of those patients and then also uh, looked at the patients who actually developed a uh, secondary uh, a second haematologic malignancy and they also subdivided less than one year or greater than one year because of that latency for the development of the malignancy. Um, they also identified uh, those patients with a secondary haematologic malignancy uh, and then uh, that, that's how those, those patients were identified um, and they also looked at a population of patients who did have a haematologic malignancy uh, and, and, and from this uh, group they worked out what the background haematologic malignancy incidence rate was um, and then worked out relative risks based on those observed patients uh, and also the expected uh, number of cases that, that would be seen in, in that cohort. But again, remembering Anna's caveat, uh, that there may be, when you're looking at a standardised instance ratio, you know there may be some differences uh, between the uh, uh, between the, the background population and those with thyroid cancer. Uh, there was quite some complicated statistics was undertaken, um, but just doing a, a rough uh, estimate of the numbers, you know we see that if you include uh, you know all patients, uh, you know the total cumulative instance of secondary hematologic malignancy you know, is quite similar. In fact, there were more in the in the surgical cohort. Uh, and when you do look at those patients who were um, just over one year of follow-up, uh, again, very similar uh, numbers of secondary hematologic malignancies that were marginally higher in the radioactive iodine group, just as a, as a check. Um, there were some issue, issues with the actual, um, the original paper. And in fact, there was a group of, uh, of nuclear medicine specialists who actually wrote uh, calling for, for retraction on, on several, raising several issues with the methodology of the paper. And I'll just, I'll address, I'll raise some of the concerns in coming slides. Um, but one of the issues was just the, uh, the actual data presented um, on, on the main figure, figure one. There were some inaccuracies that were, that were highlighted um, in terms of, uh, you know, addition. Uh, and, and so subsequently this was actually, uh, was updated uh, in uh, in April of, uh, of 2018 uh, online. Um, in terms of the results, so the multivariate analysis compared with thyroidectomy alone, so it's a surgical option compared to uh, radioactive iodine, um, it was associated with an increase in the risk of, uh, of AML, acute myeloid leukaemia, with a hazard ratio of nearly 1.8 uh, and with an absolute uh, uh, excess risk of uh, approximately 0.04%. Um, uh, there was an increase in CML, uh, chronic myeloid leukemia, with a hazard ratio of 3.44. But again, the absolute uh, excess uh, risk was only 0.05%. Uh, and interestingly, the only other significant uh, finding was that of a reduction in the 
in, in multiple myeloma with a hazard ratio of 0.65 uh, and an absolute excess risk or, or reduction of, uh, of 0.04%. Uh, um, there were other findings that when it was compared with matched thyroid cancer controls, as expected, there was a, uh, a shorter median overall survival in those patients who actually developed uh, AML. Um, and with matched, when they matched controls with de novo AML, this would be something that if, if positive, it would suggest that, because it's known that therapy related AML tends to have a, a worse prognosis. Uh, and in this cohort, it wasn't quite significant, but there was a trend toward a, a reduced survival in those patients who developed AML after treatment with radioactive iodine. Um, one of the issues that was raised about uh, the presentation of results that there was really, even though this was a primary outcome measure, um, the reduction in multiple myeloma, it really didn't really, uh, there was no further survival analysis uh, or risk time course analysis performed to examine any potential protective effect on multiple myeloma, which, uh, which would have been, been expected. Um, when looking at the, uh, at the time course analysis, it did show that um, when looking at AML, there was a, an early increase within one to two years um, after the diagnosis of thyroid cancer, and then that fell over time. Uh, and when looking at the AML uh, after surgery alone, uh, there was an early, uh, very early peak, which may have been uh, ascertainment, uh, and then it uh, a much, much smaller uh, level. With CML, there was an increase uh, earlier, um, which, which also persisted over 10 years of follow-up. Um, and there was also an increase in, in CML diagnosis, uh, but to a lesser extent. So there was controversy that was raised um, in several uh, letters to the editor. One was about some of the uh, arithmetic errors in, in, in some of the figures, which just given the difficulty of, of um, evaluating the detailed statistical analysis that was undertaken, I guess it just raised concern about the, um, uh, you know, the rigor of the, of the, um, of the statistical analysis essentially um, and there was some potential uh, the risk of misclassification or inclusion of high risk disease that may have potentially received a higher dose of radioactive iodine. Um, there was concern about the bias presentation in that um, there really was no discussion at all about multiple myeloma uh, despite it being a primary outcome of the analysis. Um, there wasn't very much discussion at all about the absolute risk differences it was predominantly of the relative risk, and, and these really are quite rare outcomes. Um, unfortunately, there was no uh, data on administered activity or dose, um, so that's just a, a limitation, I guess, of the study design using this database. Some other databases have had that information available. Uh, and, and there is that risk of the extensive statistical analysis um, required to, to achieve the results. But putting in the, in the broader context, um, and I won't go through this in much detail, um, but uh, these are the results of this uh, study. There was a Korean study that was uh, mentioned uh, by Anna as well, with a large number of, uh, of, of, of patients under study, over 200,000. And this was one where there was data available for the actual administered activity of, of radioactive iodine. Um, and it found that the, there was an increased hazard ratio with 100 to 150 millicuries of hazard ratio 3.1. Interestingly, above 150, it was a hazard ratio of 2.1, but there was no significant increased risk of less than 100 um, millicuries. Um, there was a study from Taiwan with uh, 20,000 patients, um, and without going in, in great detail, this also showed the highest risk in those patients who had over 150 millicuries uh, and an incremental risk per 30 millicuries, which, which is, uh, is of some concern. And then I've also just included, we've heard already from Anna about their large meta-analysis. So where to now? Um, well, really, I think it's critical to deliver, you know, personalised medicine, meaning, you know, the right treatment for the right patient at the right time. Uh, and in nuclear medicine, we already do have these principles of as low as reasonably achievable when dealing with, that, with radiation exposure. So my recommendations really are, you know, this is a, a very small absolute risk, particularly focusing on the leukaemia. Uh, uh, perspective, um, but to adhere to the ATA guideline recommendations, um, I think you know there's cautious use of radioactive iodine in, in low and intermediate risk disease. Um, but of course, we do have to balance the risk and, and have a very good, clear judgment of uh, you know the patient's prognosis, what their what their actual risk is of, of a cancer that we need to to treat. 
Um, and, and certainly in more advanced disease, I think it's, uh, it's important actually to go somewhat in, in personalised medicine to optimise the administered activity further. And so how can we improve risk stratification to determine suitability, to really weigh up the, the, the risk and benefit uh, of our treatment? Um, we're very familiar with the, um, the indications for post-operative R131 uh, from the ATA guidelines. Um, we know that uh, you know, radioactive iodine is not indicated in those low risk. In the broader group of intermediate risk, um, really you know, we don't get definite guidance from this document. And, and a lot of it is, uh, is to consider um, without coming down firmly. And there are other factors to consider uh, within each of these, uh, these, uh, these patient groups. And it's really in, advan in, uh, in high risk disease um, that uh, radioactive iodine is definitely recommended. So as a nuclear medicine physician, and in fact, all, for all of us as, uh, as, as, uh, as clinicians treating uh, patients with thyroid cancer, you know, we, we're faced with these two different post-therapy scans where we treat patients with uh, RAI. Um, and, and it's always, you know, the key question is, should these patients receive the same administered activity of radioactive iodine? And I think really the answer is no. You know, on the left, we've got a case with really no disease. And, and often if these patients do receive, you know, a high dose of radioactive iodine, it's often uh, obviously very disappointing. And sometimes with the patient on the right, we're left wondering whether we should have given them a higher dose of radioactive iodine. Uh, because clearly there was disease requiring treatment. So, and this is based on the ATA guidelines, the consideration of post-operative disease status in this setting. One option is using post-operative thyroglobulin uh, at six weeks. We know this can help uh, to assess for persistent disease or remnant. Um, with, you know, unstimulated uh, low thyroglobulin, there's a very low risk of disease recurrence, but those with high levels of uh, unstimulated thyroglobulin above 10, certainly up to above 30, we know there's a higher risk of persistent disease, failed ablation, and distant metastases. Um, from a nuclear medicine perspective, there's also the option of a pre-therapy radioactive iodine scan. Um, it can change management uh, in, in up to well, 25, up to 50% of cases, but there is a theoretical risk of stunning when I131 is used. So the recommendation from the guidelines, which is a, a low level recommendation, is to use either I123 or a low activity of I131 and administer the therapy within 72 hours. Um, this is just uh, a, a, an area of, of clinical interest of mine, um, but there really has been quite an ongoing evolution of thyroid cancer imaging from planar imaging on the left uh, to the advent of SPECT and SPECT-CT to get three-dimensional representation. And then more recently with the development and the use of I124 uh, with PET-CT, we really get much greater imaging resolution and quantitation that enables for dosimetry. In fact, these, uh, this is a post-therapy scan of the same patient just a few days apart. Um, this is just a general educational uh, slide about R131, which has obviously no role in therapy with a modest resolution. There is a concern about stunning when used as a, as a pre-therapy scan, a long half-life and, and delayed imaging post-therapy. R123 uh, doesn't have a beta emission, and so we, we're not concerned about uh, stunning. Um, it has a slightly higher resolution uh, as well from greater uh, photon flux, but it has a lower, shorter half-life, so imaging is done at 24 hours. And I124 is beneficial. It's imaged with PET, so we get the beneficial option for dosimetry, much higher resolution, no real significant stunning, and delayed uh, <clears throat> imaging out to 96 hours, enabling dosimetry. Uh, these are just images, different patients, but showing those characteristics. The concern with uh, using I131 or I123 is that really the only benefit is if the scan is positive. It means you may either increase the activity or plan a two-stage ablation. But there's really a very low sensitivity for detection of metastatic disease um, uh, when compared to post-therapy imaging. And so it's, if negative, you cannot omit the planned therapy. Uh, and some uh, studies have suggested no additional diagnostic value to thyroglobulin, and thus it's not commonly used around the world. With the use of pre-therapy imaging with I124, which is what we use in a cohort of our high-risk patients, we use a very low activity, um, we use multiple time point imaging, and there is good data that the low dose I124 scan accurately predicts the post-therapy or high dose I131 scan appearance. And this is a large study from uh, Germany, just showing very high accuracy uh, of detection when correlating between these with a high level of agreement. Uh, and numerous studies have shown it's superior to a diagnostic scan. Um, so I just thought I'd, I'd, I'd raise that and I'll, I'll leave it there.
but just highlighting that there is some uncertainty about the risk of secondary malignancy from retrospective studies. Um, the absolute risk is small uh, for those that have been shown with, uh, with AML and CML and slight reduction in myeloma, but additional research is needed for the risk of specific secondary malignancies. And also I think further research is warranted to explore the reduction in, uh, in, in or the, the suggestion of uh, reduced myeloma risk um, it's important to consider the risks of radioactive iodine, including its side effects like xerostomia versus the benefits, and weighing that up against the, uh, you know, the actual clinical risk of the malignancy requiring treatment. And then to consider um, when we're deciding about using radioactive iodine in this in this setting, um, adhering to the to guideline recommendations with cautious use and in low and intermediate risk. And I think there's some way to go toward optimising the dosage in uh, advanced disease. Um, with risk stratification, there'll be ongoing uh, you know, genomics research to, to characterise those at higher risk warranting therapy, the use of post-operative thyroglobulin, and the, uh, I think there's, there is a emerging role for that I124 can be used to omit uh, therapy in patients with no evidence of disease on their scan. I'll just move back to our case presentation now. Uh, you'd be familiar with, I won't read the, the slide in any uh, detail, but you'll be aware of those four options, so either additional R131 doses are not associated with high risk of secondary malignancies. The risk of secondary malignancies are only observed after 500 millicuries. C, it's unknown if additional RAI treatment results in high risk of secondary malignancies. And D, alternative treatment should be considered due to a high risk that additional RAI could result in a secondary malignancy. David, thank you very much. We're gonna, um... Just wait for folks to finish. We've just got a minute or two. And um, gosh, it looks like this is um, had this presentation has had a significant impact on our viewers in terms of um, uh, their response to this particular poll here. So um, we have just a few minutes here, and I want to just see if Anna has any particular comments to. Uh, David's presentation before I pose one or two questions to finish up our hour here. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, David. I, I thought your presentation was excellent, and and uh, I think we're basically all getting at the same uh, points. Uh, one needs to consider uh, respective individual second primary malignancies. I think the literature has evolved that we can see the behavior of second uh, different cancers is different. Um, so pooling all cancers together doesn't really make a lot of sense going forward. And I think the other thing is the absolute uh, consideration of absolute risks, not just relative risk. Because even a relative risk, I mean, if you say a relative risk of two or two and a half or, or, or 1.6, uh, that may be statistically significant, but it's really the absolute risk uh, that one should be considering um, in clinical uh, decision making and 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 policy making, uh, not just the relative risk. So I think we we're in agreement on those things, those topics. Great. Um, so in, very quickly here, Anna or David, do you um, uh, in particular, Anna, do you have any particular um, information or even speculation about a subgroup analysis related to uh, pre-menopausal pre -menopausal versus um, pay, uh, women who have uh, reached menopause when they are um, undergoing RAI exposure? Uh, so I guess the question would be, are you relating this to uh, particular malignancy like breast malignancy or, uh, or just in general? specifically breast malignancy. Yeah, uh, we didn't do any form of analysis. I know there was a recent systematic review published in Frontiers of Endocrinology, and I don't believe they did a second analysis on that. You know, um, age of menopause uh, really isn't registered in a lot of cancer registries. So um, in terms of, uh, I think there there's a bit of a challenge. The other thing is that I mean, we published a systematic review probably another decade, a decade ago or so. So the age of menopause may be slightly earlier, like a year. Uh, so it may not be clinically significant in women treated with radioiodine. But the other thing is if you're giving radioactive iodine to a woman 
who is in her you know late 40s that may be uh, accelerated and you sometimes see where their periods don't come back so i think it's also um the treatment itself has an impact on the uh age of menopause to some extent so that would be a little it would be challenging to analyze but i think uh i think it's a relevant question uh, remember, when you're studying young patients that are premenopausal, 20 and 30 year olds, you'd have to study them for an awfully long time um, uh, in terms of uh, breast cancer latency, because the risks in that population would be generally quite low. If you're studying patients who've had prior external beam radiation for a Hodgkin's lymphoma as a child, well, that's a different story. They're getting serial MRIs. And so you may be detecting things earlier. So I think it's a challenging question. I don't have the answer uh, for it. And I think you'd need very, um, you'd need clinically detailed data relating to uh, the uh, reproductive and menstrual history, which I'm, I'm not aware of uh, in some of these very large data sets. Great. And, and one last question related to um, the relative risk of children who are exposed to radioactive iodine um, for pediatric thyroid malignancy and whether that particular cohort um, you have any information related to uh, their relative risk um, of second malignancies later in life? Not in our review, because uh, really the the data was largely in adults. They're um, uh, you know 18 or older, 21 or older. So I don't personally have data on that uh, on that group. Would you speculate that that's a group at significantly higher risk, or is it impossible to comment on that? Um, I think you could uh, you could look at it. What you'd want is actually to interrogate these databases specifically for that population. Um, so I haven't seen a systematic review or meta-analysis um, uh, looking at all those data because you'd need a lot of data uh, similar to what we have. So um, I haven't seen, I, there's some primary studies, but um, I'm not sure if there's enough right now, but I haven't looked at it in detail systematically to see whether there is enough data to, um, to pool uh, uh, data from pediatric population. It's a very interesting question, very right. relevant. Well, listen, um, we are right at the nine o'clock hour. I want to thank both of you for really outstanding um, and extremely relevant presentations. And I'm sure that our attendees um, thoroughly enjoyed it. I learned a great deal. Thank you, uh, particularly to David for um, uh, for the um, for joining us from Australia at this time. Outstanding presentations to both of you. We welcome all of you to come back next week and uh, just hope everybody stays safe in the interim. Thanks again.